Okay, well, we'll get started. Welcome and thank you to everyone for showing up uh, for today's uh, lunch discussion with Dr. Christine Slaughter and Dr. Princess William, UCI President's Postdoc, um, for today's President's Postdoc panel. Um, by way of introduction, um, I'm going to turn the forum over to m Professor Michael Tesler and Davin Phoenix, um, who've been so gracious in organizing today's event. And uh, please join me in welcoming our two outstanding postdocs to our center. What, what a wonderful um, accomplishment to have you both here. And thank you, for, thank you for joining us today. We're really, really happy. Congratulations. Michael. All right. So I have the pleasure of introducing Christine Slaughter. Uh, Christine Slaughter, like all of the best uh, work on, on race and politics is a UCLA PhD. Um, I've got to know her um, for the last five years or so. And I always had a feeling she was going to be great. And her work has since proven that that was an understatement because she's doing fantastic uh, work. Her dissertation uh, really represents the best of political science where she grounds it deep in an original theory and then goes through the rigor of testing her results, her new measurement, and ultimately showing that they're incredibly important for our understanding of um, American politics. And so that's what she'll be presenting from today is her outstanding dissertation, soon to be outstanding book, no Strangers to Hardship, African-Americans, Inequality and in the Politics of Resilience um, as an indicator that I'm not just biased in favor of UCLA PhD. It's already a work that has received considerable recognition um, in the forms of lots of outside money and um, lots of uh, sweet positions, including this and then um, she will soon be a uh, postdoc at the Center for Democratic Politics at Princeton. And then after that, we'll begin her tenure track position at BU. Um, so we are very, very happy to have her even briefly on her immediate uh, road to stardom. <laughs> so thank you, Christine. I hope I didn't embarrass you. No, no, not at all. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Michael, for the very generous um, introduction. And thank you, um, Simone and Graham and the Department of Political Science and the Center um, for the Study of Democracy for having me uh, here today. I am going to uh, present a bit of my dissertation work um, that I defended <laughs> in June. So it's still very fresh. So this is the first uh, post uh, dissertation uh, presentation. And just for all the graduate students, either near or about to be at the hump, it does get better. So just wanted to throw that out there. Um, so I'm going again to present some of my dissertation work. Um, and again, if you all want to find me on Twitter, please feel free to, to talk about the presentation only if they're good things. If there are things that you think, you know, you wanna talk about a little more, send that to me in an email. I appreciate that a lot. So let's go ahead and get started. PowerPoint, let's get started. Okay. Um, present. Okay, so. One second, everybody. Apologies. Wow. Okay. Um, one second. Um. Okay, so for some strange reason, um, my presentation does not want to advance. Would anyone know why that's the case? So one option is that you can send it to Graham and Graham can run it. Graham, are you the host? 
Who am I hosting? Yeah, this will be. Yeah, I, I can. You can send it to me. I, I, can, okay. I can advance it. Okay, well, let's do that. Uh, my apologies. How about we? Are you just doing share screen, or are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing share screen. And try going hosting. to try going to advance on Zoom, advance share, and just share a portion, and then you can drag it to that window. Okay, let's see. Stop share. Thank you everybody for your patience. Share screen. Share PowerPoint. Format. Play from start. Yeah, it is not. Hmm. Okay. Let's try it this way. You want to just send it to me? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll just send it to you a little bit because I'm just not sure how it doesn't want to advance. So I will email it to you right now. Okay. Let's switch the order just to give Christine a chance to. That's a good. <laughs> good again. That's a good plan. Okay, yeah, we can um, yeah. hopefully Princess doesn't have technical issues too, but I can introduce Princess. So Michael laid down quite the gauntlet. But <laughs> I do. I do. Michigan, uh, Princess Williams keeps the robust tradition of Michigan alum doing cutting edge research alive and well in her work. Uh, originally from Jackson, Mississippi and a proud alum of the Jackson State University, uh, Princess earned her PhD, defended her dissertation earlier this summer from the University of Michigan. Uh, she, like Christine, is with us for the summer before starting a one-year postdoctoral fellowship at Amherst College, after which she'll begin a tenure-track position in the position uh, in the Department of Political Science at Amherst. Uh, Princess's research is broadly focused on the politics of race and space. She thinks through how subnational identities and regional cultures shape political behavior across racial and ethnic groups. She also thinks about the implications of or for American political development. Uh, her main project develops a novel construct of Southern identity, and she's able to explore the impact of this adherent Southern identity on Southern individuals, political engagement, and racial attitudes and behavior. Her work has received numerous uh, lauds and funding, including the National Science Foundation Dissertation Research Improvement Grant, UM's Center for Political Studies Haynes Walton Jr. Race and Ethnic Politics Grant, the Garth Taylor Public Opinion Dissertation Fellowship. Uh, Princess has also been very active in diversity, inclusion, and equity efforts, serving in uh, student advocacy organizations, including Students of Color at Rackham, political science color within the political science department at UM and the Alliance of Graduate Education and the professor. And so I'm excited for Princess to share uh, some of her work with us today. Can you all see the screen? Yes. Okay, good. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, like Davin said, I'm Princess Williams. Um, I wanna thank the Department of Political Science and the um, um, UC um, Presidential Fellow for inviting me out for the summer um, to work with Davin and uh, continue to build this work, um, which started as my dissertation and now um, my current book project. Um, and the title of the book project is The Politics of Place, How Southern Identity Shapes American Political Beliefs. And what I generally argue is that um, identifying with the South um, and as a Southerner has political implications for um, how both Black Americans and white Americans think about politics. And so really trying to understand how place um, shapes, um, will make uh, Americans look different politically. Um, first, um, before we get started, I wanted to just clarify what I mean by the South um, whenever I'm referencing Southern identity um, or, uh, or this culture related to the American South. So while doing this work um, or, um, over the last seven years, I've learned that 
Um, people have very strong beliefs about what is considered to be the South and what, what isn't. Um, and so for the purpose of this project, um, I classify the South or Southern identity as having a psychological attachment and affect for states that seceded from the Union. Um, uh, because these states have like this shared um, historical legacy um, and they share political de developments. Um, however, um, later in the talk, you'll see you don't have to live in these states to have a Southern identity. So um, um, the, the primary puzzle of the, the project is this. Um, given um, so much hist historical, so sociological, um, and uh, political science literature, people have argued that Southern culture and Southerners are uh, distinct because they have um, a different socialization um, compared to Americans living in other regions. And so my primary, my primary argument is this, I mean, question is this, um, does identification with the South lead to distinct political predispositions and uh, preferences for um, black and white Americans, given that we um, so much literature argue that the region is distinct culturally, politically, and socially. So looking at the literature on sub Southern public opinion, um, a lot of the literature focused primarily on white Americans. So what they find is compared to whites um, living in other regions, whites who live in the South are more racially conservative, more socially conservative, um, and more likely to support Republican candidates um, during pre presidential elections. And um, all of this work really shows that um, region plays a role in um, what well, drive differences in um, how whites think about politics and their behavior. Um, however, the previous literature faced two primary uh, limitations. So first, um, the first limitation is um, there are many inadequate and inconsistent measurements used to um, capture this Southerness, this idea of Southerness or um, Southern affect or Southern, what I call Southern identity. So in most of the literature, people um, use um, um, the South dummy variable, um, which only indicates whether someone lives in the South at the uh, time of the survey. Um, it doesn't uh, have any information um, on how long they live in the, in the South and um, it doesn't capture any information about one's cognitive orientation to place. And even with um, using the South dummy variable, um, most of the times they use national surveys to look at regional differences, um, um, trying to understand how this Southern socialization drive these political distinctions among white Americans. However, um, using the dummy variable coupled with national surveys, you have even more error um, given that national surveys are not designed to be uh, regionally representative. And a, so what, pe what uh, scholars have normally used, um, com done to like overcome some, some of the, these issues is uh, combined sur surveys over time. Um, but these surveys still combining over time, you're not getting regionally representative samples. Um, you're more likely to get people, um, for example, in the South, Southern respondents are more likely to come from uh, um, Tex Texas, North Carolina, and Florida, which are not representative of the South. So um, you're not really, you're not really, cap with a dummy variable, you're not capturing anything about uh, cognitive orientation. And with the um, national survey, you're not really um, having, you, you can't make a claim about the region if you're not having a representative sample. Um, and so the second limitation is um, this black monolithic assumption. So like I said earlier, most of the literature um, is focusing on, on Southern whites. Uh, <clears throat> and it's because of this assumption that um, being Southerner is, being a Southerner is not politically meaningful for black Americans. Um, and especially um, given that we know that black Americans, um, there's so much uh, uniformity in how blacks vote in their party identification. And, and I'll go back. To, so given this, we don't know. We People have made assumptions that Southern identity is not meaningful for Black Americans, but we really don't know. No one has tested this. No one has um, um, looked um, to, to see whether there are regional differences, with the exception of a few um, recent scholars. So the primary um, aims of the, the project is to, one, create a um, cross uh, racial survey measurement of Southern identity, and two, to investigate how Southern identity shape um, black and white political um, behavior. So first I'll define Southern identity. Um, I just argue that it's a social identity comprised of high positive uh, psychological attachment and ethic for place. 
And um, my argument is that it equips individuals with this cultural filter or like a cultural lens um, that may shape how, um, shape their worldview to reflect um, the region's um, perceived cultural values and norms. And so um, to um, develop this, uh, this measurement of Southern identity and also to understand what are these perceived uh, Southern um, cultural norms uh, related to the South, I over the last couple of years, I've uh, collected a variety of qualitative data, starting with um, in-depth interviews um, and moving to um, newspaper data, Twitter data, and open-ended uh, responses and surveys um, to really um, create a typology of like, um, one, understanding Southern culture, but also motivating my questions for my Southern identity measurement. And I'm not gonna talk much more about the qualitative data, but I'll just give you an example of some of the things that um, people, um, thought about the South. So in uh, on two surveys, I asked an open-ended question. Um, when you hear the phrase um, the South um, or the word Southerners, what traits and characteristics come to mind? And so the larger the word um, words appear here, um, they were more likely used, they were more uh, used in the uh, open-ended responses. And so using a variety of qualitative data, I just created the, these, uh, this typology of Southern culture, um, which um, I argue that if one has a Southern identity, uh, a strong Southern identity, their political um, attitudes should align with these three uh, elements. So first would be communalistic. Um, they should be more likely to um, uh, have whole attitudes or uh, support policies that um, support the greater good of the racial group. Um, and so their, their interests should not be individual, individualistic or um, motivated. They should be um, thinking about how could they maximize their own racial group's interests. The second element is uh, traditionalism um, and is conceptualized as beliefs and efforts centered around maintaining and promoting tradition and uh, conventional social norms. And the uh, final uh, element is hierarchism. Uh, it's this feature um, that seeks to promote respect um, for, um, for authority and obedience uh, to authority in high level positions of power, also maintain social order and um, it encourages stiff punishment for any um, deviance. And so um, in terms of how I think about Southern identity across racial groups, so the development, the development of Southern identity differs across racial groups, of course. Uh, for whites, um, um, scholars argue that, you know, the development started uh, during the Civil War and for Blacks, many uh, um, historians argue that it started um, in the Civil, during the, well, after the Civil uh, Rights era. Uh, however, I argue that although like the historical development of these identities across racial groups differ, the psychological dimensions, uh, we, should, we can use the same questions to uh, measure the psychological, psych psychological dimensions of Southern identity. Um, and so, um, Going back to um, thinking about Southern identity for Black Americans, there is a lot of literature on Southern identity for, um, um, for whites who, who live in the region. However, um, for Black Americans, um, many argue that, um, that only white Americans really um, glamorized the South. And you know, this belief that Blacks wanted to be Southerners was, was crazy. And um, also they argue that you know, being Southern, a Southerner and being Black um, was not compatible for black interests, well, to maximize black interests. However, um, after the civil rights movement, um, there is this emergent literature, body of literature that looks at Southern identity and how blacks who live in the region um, really um, were invested in the region's politics and, and um, also influenced with, um, really invested in how the, uh, the region uh, progresses in um, different, um, um, in ways in which how black, blacks can make uh, differences uh, politically to um, increase their political interests and their economic interests. Um, and also there's some uh, literature that, that looks at this, I, this phenomenon that started in the 1970s, um, um, what um, demographers, demographers call the, the reverse great migration. Um, so uh, over the past um, 40 years, we see um, blacks in every other region, um, blacks are moving back to the South um, at record rates and um, Demographers have argued that Blacks are seeing the South in a different light. Um, so um, compared to their home region, they see that they have uh, more opportunities for uh, political power and economic uh, power. So they're moving back to the South. And given this literature, um, I looked at political science surveys to really understand how Black think about the South or, and also how whites are thinking about the South. So really looking at national surveys to, to um, understand 
to see if there is a measurement, some measurement of Southern identity. Um, um, and what I found that was there, there weren't any measurements of Southern identity. The, the closest thing that um, came that I could use to really understand like place-based affect um, as it relates to the South was this um, South filling thermometer um, that was on the American National Election Survey from 1962 until 20, uh, I mean, 2018. And what I find was before the civil rights movement in the 60s, um, there was this huge gap um, in how black and whites, um, black and whites in the South thought about, uh, felt the, their level of warmth towards the South. However, after the, the um, civil rights movement, that um, gap declined. And in 2018, you see no difference in level of warmth towards the South. Um, and also, if you look at the non-South um, South column, Blacks who live outside of the South, they share the same level of warmth towards, this, um, towards, um, towards the region as Blacks and whites who live in the region. Um, and also, um, in throughout the, the qualitative data, there is a, a lot of um, discussion of how Blacks are thinking about the South, contrary to what previous literature in the early um, um, 19th, 20th century, what they argued that Blacks didn't care about the South. But um, in the qualitative literature, um, a lot of the a lot of, a lot of the, the data suggests that blacks are um, developing these more positive sentiments about the South. So, given all this literature, um, I move to you know create a theory and measurement of Southern identity, and I argue that you know it's comprised of, of two positive um, two uh, components: um, uh, positive affect and positive attachment. And these are the questions uh, that I developed based on the qualitative literature, I mean, yeah, the qualitative data and the previous literature. Um, and all these questions include five point Likert scale responses. And I argue that um, the questions are, you know, measuring either a dimension of ethic or uh, uh, a measure, uh, a dimension, uh, uh, this attachment dimension. And so this is just a list of data that I've um, used over the years. Um, and I will be presenting results from study five. Um, which was a um, Southern Identity Scale that I, I mean, a survey that I uh, did in uh, January 2020, which included 800 respondents, and it included uh, seven uh, items um, seeking to measure Southern identity. And so um, to examine the measurement hypotheses, which is, you know, this proposed um, that these Southern identity items could constitute a latent construct and could be categorized uh, into um, two components. I perform um, uh, exploratory factor analysis uh, with um, seven um, questions. And for um, ease of, uh, so basically what I found was that there were, the, the evidence showed that two factors were sufficient um, to um, construct this like latent concept of what I call Southern identity. And after, you know, I did that, I, I used two surveys to really understand like, is this, a, a, these, are, if these uh, items could create this scale. Um, and I found um, support in both of those surveys. I, in the third survey, which was the YouGov survey, I performed this uh, confirmatory factor analysis. And I also found that um, the structure um, did, um, was statistically, um, 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 it, it met the uh, statistical thresh threshold to, um, which indicated that th these factors were um, um, sufficient. And so um, given the results of the scale, I uh, first looked at some um, descriptive analyses looking at um, Southern identity across race. I found that there is no racial difference in Southern identity. And within the, um, the South, I found that there are no um, um, differences in Southern identity for Blacks who live in the South and whites who live in the South. And this is just um, some mapping. Um, I found that, of course, major majority of the Southern identifiers live in the South, but there were Southern identifiers living um, in other regions. For example, the Midwest had a good number um, um, of Southern identifiers across racial groups. And so going to my public opinion hypotheses, basically I argue that both Blacks and whites who score high on Southern identity would be more likely to um, um, hold political views aligned with um, um, these um, communalistic, traditionalistic, and hierarchical um, uh, perceived norms, um, Southern cultural norms. Um, and simply for rate on racial issues, we should see that blacks should, black and white should be more like the whole attitudes um, that are designed to maximize their group interests. And on social and economic issues, uh, they should more like the whole attitudes that are uh, seeking to promote tradition and social order. 
and I'm not going to look at, I'm not going to present um, all the results today. I'm focusing primarily on the race domain, but um, this is just a list of um, the um, dependent variables and the analysis that I did for my dissertation. And so in all the results that I show here, um, there are results from multivariate OLS regressions. The independent variable for all the models are um, my Southern identity scale, and I have a variety of uh, control variables, and all the dependent variables are uh, coded zero to one. And so this is just a summary of, of all the results um, that I found, and I'll go into detail of, um, to show you um, the, um, the graph. So for Blacks, um, I find that they're more supportive of reparations and affirmative action. For Whites, I find that they're more supportive of keeping the Confederate flag. And surprisingly, in three surveys, I still haven't uh, really understood why I found this finding, but wh uh, Whites who score high on Southern identity are more supportive of affirmative action. For Blacks, um, I find no, re no relationship with um, support for removing the flag and Southern identity or any like high or um, this uh, racial animus. And for whites, um, I find no relationship with opposition to reparations and um, or in higher levels of uh, racial animus. So on reparations, um, I find support for my uh, hypotheses. The question just asks, you know, given, you know, this historical, um, Given um, the history of, of slavery and um, Jim Crow and oppression, racial oppression in America, um, would you support reparations um, for African Americans? And I find that Blacks who score high on Southern identity, they're more, more supportive of uh, reparations. And like I said, no difference for, black, uh, for white Americans. Um, for room with a, fair, a Confederate flag, um, I find that um, no difference for Black Americans again and for white, um, I find that they were less supportive of removing uh, the Confederate flag from um, state buildings and um, federal buildings. Well, yeah, state buildings. And, and for uh, affirmative action, again, I find that Southern Blacks um, are more um, supportive of uh, affirmative, Southern identify, high Southern identifiers across racial groups are more supportive of affirmative action, um, all is equal. And I'm not gonna show the graphs here, but this, these are just a um, rundown of the findings from um, in the social domains and economic domains that I looked at in my dissertation. Um, so on social issues, I found that both blacks and whites are more supportive of capital punishment, um, prayer in school, and less uh, support for um, abortion. So when Southern identity increases, support for these, um, these um, policies increase. And on economic um, um, issues, I found that um, blacks are more supportive or who score high on Southern identity were more supportive of spending on welfare, um, the military, spending on military operations and border security. And for whites, I find the same, um, they're more supportive of spending on the military and border security. So in, in summary, um, what I tried to do in my dissertation was um, create this re uh, reliable and valid measurement of Southern identity that can be used um, to really understand the political implications of um, of um, these place-based identities across race within America and across um, th um, the world. And also really to um, think about how can we really um, 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 capture like cognitive impact, impact um, um, well, cognitive uh, affect for place compared to just using a, a, a residency variable, which doesn't tell us much about um, identity. And um, I use this theory to investigate heterogeneity in black and white public opinion. And I also use like a mixed method approach to studying, uh, to creating this scale of Southern identity, which provides new data. So thank you all. I'm looking forward to your questions and feedback. Thank you, Princess. I think uh, Michael and I plan to offer some brief discussion comments on each presentation and then have questions. So I think for ease and flow, we can provide our comments after both presentations and then have Q&A. So we'll give the floor over to Christine. And thank you again, Princess, great presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Princess. I do think I'm ready to go. So here we go. Okay, can everyone see my slides? And can everyone see them advance? All right, we're in the we're in the game. Okay, everyone. So I'll skip the big introduction, um, and I'll get right into what we saw this past summer. 
well, summer of 2020. So at the time of working on thinking about racial resilience, we experienced what some would say would be the biggest uprising centering racial justice um, in the past 50 years. And this is, of course, after um, the unfortunate murder of George Floyd. And in, in response to this pandemic, we did see that um, folks hit the streets of all racial and ethnic backgrounds. But I want to bring your attention to this one sign that this one um, little boy had in Atlanta, Georgia. And the sign reads, we didn't come this far to only come this far. And what I'm going to argue throughout the presentation is that although we saw this sign in 2020, this, is, this ethos of racial resilience is something that's reverberated through African-American culture going back um, for generations. So what is African-American racial resilience? How do we see it and how do we define it? Um, so throughout the dissertation, I spoke a lot about how we can see racial resilience influencing both um, non-electoral participation, such as the protests that we're seeing here today, but also electoral participation. So throughout, um, particularly within many elections, we see politicians, both black and white, here an African-American John Lewis, make appeals to black perseverance throughout politics. So similar to the sign that the little boy had um, at the protest in Atlanta, John Lewis to an audience says, we've made too much progress and we're not going back, we're going forward. This is why we'll go to the polls and we'll vote like we never vo voted before. And as you all know, this is in 2016. Um, unfortunately, this was in support, well not unfortunately, but the candidate that this was in support of, Hillary Clinton did not win the election. But we also know that the year 2016 was the first election that we did not have protections of uh, the Voting Rights Act, which helped many African-Americans in the South have a free and fair access to the ballot box. So that's on the table there. So thinking about what I'm gonna talk about today, I'm gonna introduce to you all the theory of racial resilience, talk about measurement, um, talk about some sets of results, which uh, are actually some new results that I have going back to um, May, 2021, right, uh, when I was wrapping up the dissertation research. So some of them fit the theory and some of them will offer a great departure point for conversation. So again, the broad research question of main findings is how does a perception of racial resilience among African-Americans influence the frequency and substance of their participation? I find across the board that uh, African-Americans with a perception of racial resilience are more associated in higher cost and higher risk uh, acts of political participation, and I'll explain what that is throughout the presentation. And I find that racially resilient African-Americans um, do engage in these acts more than non-racially resilient African-Americans. So throughout the presentation, I'm just looking at Black people and I'm comparing racially resilient African-Americans to non-racially resilient African-Americans. So just some background, much about what we know around Black um, political behavior is that it anchors on Black identity. And scholars over time have really chiseled at what Black identity is and how it's motivating. Um, so again, um, early in the 1980s, work kind of coming out of the civil rights movement looked at the role of Black consciousness. And this is a combined sense of political efficacy, which induces, and political mistrust, which turns African-Americans to political involvement. Um, I think the, the stalwart of much Black politics research, Michael Dawson's view of linked fate, is that it's African-Americans interdependent ties, that is the ability to feel connected to one another that makes them more likely um, to support the Democratic Party. So again, we don't really have implications for behavior, but we have implications for public opinion. And then we know Catherine Tate's work, which does look at the role of this interdependency on political participation. And she finds that uh, African-American sense of common fate is connected to participation in conventional activities. But if we think about what I just showed you, we don't see a lot of participation, but we do see participation of African-American and conventional uh, participation, but we know that there's also non-conventional participation. So there is some, some remaining questions that are on the table, particularly around how does uh, identity, again, in the 21st century, but also in 2020, um, move African-Americans to participation? And then how do we measure this identity that we find is so mobilizing for Black political behavior? So just briefly, we know Black consciousness is kind of uh, open as to what it is. So going back to uh, Shingle's work, basically he counted how many racial references were in an open-ended question. 
Um, we know Dawson has a singular question of does what happened to other Black Americans influence your life? And we know Compensate 2 is really measured however folks see fit sometimes. So we know that there's a little bit of conceptual mismatch and inconsistent measurement of what this Black consciousness is that motivates participation. So thinking about the resilience of Black Americans, we can look towards other disciplines to have some insight into what resilience, um, how resilience may move for Black people. So resilience itself, so this is not novel to my research, this is again borrowing from outside uh, social sciences, is it measures how individuals are successful despite high levels of stress and trauma afflicted upon them in early life. And we know resilient people are those that are able to adapt. And this is a dynamic process. So we're not necessarily born resilient. African-Americans aren't exclusively resilient. We know this is something that develops over time and in the context of interacting with individuals in different institutions. And a part of one major insight in psychology is that African-Americans have learned to overcome oppression. So kind of where we get close to thinking about a group-based model of resilience is in the cultural psychology literature that tries to at least conceptualize how does this individual level attribute manifest at the group level among African-Americans. But we don't necessarily have something clear cut in political science as it relates to politics to explain uh, the role of African-American racial resilience on political behavior. So here's where I come in. I come in just to make sense of how we understand African-Americans building racial resilience. So a lot of the work, um, including folks on this call, and of course, Dr. Williams herself, understand how Black institutions, the Black press, the Black church, Black social organizations are important for creating a Black cultural identity. But also we know that these spaces constrain African-Americans in their ability um, to behave independently. So this is going back to Cheryl Laird and Ishmael White's recent work on the racialized social constraint. So we know that African-Americans' indulgence in these institutions is what kind of reinforces their ability um, to make cultural and group-based decisions. But we also have this component of Black culture that socializes messages of resilience. So these are things such as, you know, we won't turn back now, where there's a will, there's a way, um, making a way out of no way. I don't know if anyone's into old songs, but, you know, the McFadden, you know, ain't no stopping us now. That is kind of a part of a message of resilience that we've seen socialized, particularly as it pertains to Black people. But we also know Black Americans experience a lot of economic subjugation and this too has been, if this too has enforced, me enforced messages of resilience, such as working twice as hard to get hat this far, and this too shall pass. And that's a religious verse um, coming from the King James Version of the Bible. So how do we define the resilience to adversity? So what I'm going to, to argue is that resilience, racial resilience is a novel form of group consciousness, which will characterize uh, African-Americans response to collective hardships. So we're gonna see two parts. We're gonna see um, economic subjugation. So African-Americans awareness of economic subjugation and we're gonna see their orientation towards triumph. So that's kind of how the measure is designed. And just to clear some throats to show that I'm not making this up, black people too refer to themselves as a resilient. So this again, during the summer of uprisings, we see that in Portland, Oregon, there was a Black Resilience Fund, which sought to redistribute funds to African-Americans. And we also see uh, former mayor, Stephanie Rollins Blake, refer to the city of Baltimore, a predominantly Black city, as resilient as they cleaned up um, from the riots due to the murder of Freddie Gray. So how might we see racial resilience impact participation? I'm gonna argue that racial resilience is particular to higher cost acts of political engagement, so we should see this with the types of acts African-Americans have been subject to. So again, we've seen African-Americans wait in line in order to vote, and we've seen folks attend uh, protest demonstrations despite the risk of arrest. Um, and at the time of this study, um, vaccines, well not vaccines, um, exposure to infectious diseases because of the ongoing uh, novel coronavirus. So I'm going to characterize, so not looking at standard active participation, I do that in the dissertation, but um, I'm going to just talk about some of these higher stress and higher risk political acts. So again, this is the primary argument is that racial resilience is distinct from an individual resilience. It's a salient cultural identity for African Americans, and we should see it associated with higher risk, higher uh, stress political behavior. So thinking about measurement, there was a lot of stuff that went into making a measure of racial resilience, but I'm only gonna talk about the most recent study 
that I've conducted where I specifically looked at African Americans, registered and non-registered. And this again is April in 2021. So this is after the election. This is after um, we have access to a vaccine. Um, and I'm, an, I'm mentioning this now because um, it did temper kind of the salience of racial resilience. And I wrote about this at the end of the dissertation is that um, the way that we can understand how racial resilience is activated and how it's carried is that we should really see spikes in terms of moments of racial unrest. However, we are starting, or at least in this iteration, I did see a drop off in terms of the salience of racial resilience on certain political behavior acts. And while it feels sort of counterintuitive, what it is is exciting to see that moments of racial injustice can activate African-American sense of racial resilience. Okay, so going through the scale, there are eight items. Um, they are um, on two separate dimensions. So a scale that kind of correlates to the role of subjugation and one that correlates to the role of triumph. However, I, throughout, I will analyze, it's just one standard scale and I'm gonna look at this in a summate, summative. So I'm gonna combine the values and then I'm going to average them. So I just wanna call your attention to, um, it's a Cronbach Alpha around 0.74. So this is quite modest in terms of its ability to be internally reliable and consistent. In previous iterations, um, it was 0.78 and 0.76. So again, seeing some of the drop off in terms of how these items are related. However, um, there's one item that if removed, um, it will increase the Cronbach Alpha to around 0.86, which is around where we want to see a scale. Just in terms of distribution, what you might see for the racial resilience uh, score, so this again is the average of all the items, is that it's very much right skewed. And while this isn't a normative um, scale, what we are seeing is that African-Americans may just be overwhelmingly higher in racial resilience. And this is something that kind of fits into the norms of African-American culture and particularly how we can see group-based attributes manifest at the individual level. Okay, and this is about a mean of 0.73. So again, this is a higher mean. So when I show you some of the behavioral outcomes of racial resilience, I'm going to start at the 0.4 because it's very much right skewed. So I just want you to see that there's no cases um, living down here. So just thinking about defining racial resilience, we have some, um, particularly what I would expect in terms of what resilience is, we see African-Americans use the language of resilience to define resilience. Um, for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip over some of what folks uh, defined racial resilience as, but again, it's still this ethos of perseverance. Um, we are strong in the face of adversity and we'll survive and thrive. Okay. Thinking about some of the behavioral implications of racial resilience, again, this is where things get um, a little spicy. So we do see that um, looking at the role of racial resilience, so this is a regression controlling for individual resilience, linked fate, gender, education, income, partisan identity, ideology, um, also controlling for internal efficacy, which is really a big computer. Um, for racial resilience, but I wanted to show you all kind of what the true uh, value of this racial resilience measure is. We do see that there is a slightly positive influence of racial resilience, but it fails to meet the threshold of significance. But when we look at racial resilience in relationship to the controls, we do see the work that it's doing despite having such big competitors such as um, internal efficacy, education, and income. So while it's not, um, strong in the magnitude that I would like. It does work in the direction that I expected, and it works on top of competing hypotheses around the role of uh, African-American political behavior. But what I wanna call your attention to is that we see a relationship between racial resilience and waiting in line to vote, and also attending protest demonstrations. We do not see, um, we see a slightly negative, but could be um, no effect of facing issues while voting. And we see some pretty decent effects for attending a community meeting. So what these look like on an individual level is that we see um, a slight increase, again, of waiting in line to vote. And I guess I want to pause here to say what's important is that when thinking about waiting in line to vote, again, um, as I positioned in the beginning of the presentation, this is something that's particular to African-Americans when it comes to political participation. So I embedded each of these questions in a vignette in order to understand how are African-Americans perceiving different types of political participation acts. So again, I asked folks how long um, would they wait in line to vote? 
And even for one, um, one case, so one open-ended uh, response to this, someone said, I'll wait as long as it takes, or even one person said until Jesus comes back, which I thought was quite funny because this is kind of feeding into how uh, African-Americans perceive certain acts of political participation. When we look at attending protest demonstrations, so again, this is something that we saw this past summer, we see that African-Americans higher in racial resilience are more inclined um, to attend or be willing to attend protest demonstrations with risk. When we see um, an act such as attending a community meeting, um, we see that there is a slight different differentiation of African-Americans lower and higher in racial resilience. This is where I want to call your attention to the truncated um, x-axis. But we see that even um, despite this, folks say they are willing to attend a community meeting if they're higher in racial resilience. And we kind of don't see any main effects, um, even though we saw the initial result around facing issues while voting. So waiting in line to vote, we do see that African-Americans are more likely to engage. However, when it comes to facing issues while voting, we don't see that, um, we don't see an increase in terms of racial resilience and the willingness to participate. So thinking about what this means, first, we just can kind of take stock and say that there are some behavioral consequences of racial resilience. Probably a little more clarifying to understand under what conditions we see uh, racial resilience having influence on political participation. But we know these are positive relationships and they're working in the direction that I expected just with the slightly decreased magnitude of what I would have liked to see. Um, so in conclusion, um, thinking about racial resilience and how um, this is really a part of the African-American experience within uh, the United States is one of resilience and perseverance. And again, something to say that we, we didn't come this far to only come this far. So kind of my next steps is that um, I've truncated the scale, so I'm running um, a smaller version of the scale on the 2020 CMPS, so where I'll be able to look at a nationally representative sample, again, on, of African Americans to understand how racial resilience um, is influenced by a multitude of factors. Um, and then there are some additional questions around the political impacts of racial resilience that I'm really hoping, or that I'm moving to take up in the book project around how might we see racial resilience be activated and how might we see folks benefit from having higher racial resilience? And then again, thinking about to the 2020 elections, as we see African-American voting rights come under attack and as we see folks fight in resistance to, um, to the attack on black voting rights, it'll be really important to kind of key into what racial resilience is and how we might see both politicians, also organizers utilize racial resilience to speak to the black electorate. Um, oh, this was after um, something happened in Georgia. I can't specifically recall, but basically they're saying you awoken every uh, Democrat in the state and they will find a way to vote. And I think specific, particularly looking in the South, I think resilience will be something that's important to take up in the 2022 midterms. Okay, so thank you all. I look forward to the comments and the discussion. Um, and thank you for your patience in getting the show set up. Thank you, Christine. Um, so I think Michael and I will now take more than five minutes to offer some comments. Michael, would you like to go first or should I go? Either one. Uh, I'll go since I'm on okay. um, Let me pull up my notes. Let me start my time. Really enjoyed both these projects. I've been a fan of these projects for a while. Uh, I'll begin, uh, Princess, with you. Um, I appreciate that you showed us that the Southern identity isn't limited to people that are currently living in the South. It made me think of the old adage, you know, you can take the person out the country, you can't take the country out the person. I'm curious when that Southern identity is crystallized, what are the critical stages or interventions that make this, um, you know, a salient identity to adhere to? My suspicion, based on my own experiences, is that it's something that probably comes in youth, right? Which so I think those high school experiences, I'm really curious about kind of what it is that makes this take shape, especially since people can leave the South and stay with it. And I wonder to what degree this element is a key in that reverse migration you spoke to. I also wonder about that reverse migration. I don't know how you could get a handle on this, but whether the folks that have been moving steadily back are adhering to those same Southern norms or if they are potentially reshaping or disrupting those norms in any way. But in terms of more concrete things you probably get a handle on, 
some of those trends are really interesting and I wonder what they imply about um, white and black Southerners perceptions of uh, economic opportunities or kind of group interests. So when you highlight greater support for military, I think spending, you know, that could be the kind of hierarchism and the traditionalism, but it also be, you know, higher proportion of Southerners uh, enlisted in the military, right? And that's a group interest thing. We want more spending because maybe that goes back to our people that are active duty. Um, and so similarly, I wonder to what degree Southern identity is related to religious and specifically different Protestant denominations, right? How much can you not only think about the connection between the two, but tease out, right? What is doing the work between Southern identity and kind of religious identity, religiosity, and some of those outcomes um, yeah, and so in thinking about like the lack of relationship for whites that identify the South and racial resentment, I think was your measure, right? So I wonder, does that mean that old fashioned prejudice is playing a stronger role here? What does that potentially convey about what racial resentment can tap into, right? Um, thinking about the racial resentment and those kinds of questions and kind of the white support for affirmative action um, are they seeing themselves as not necessarily losing out from affirmative action measures, right? Because they don't see themselves as having the same access to elite spaces that affirmative action might give you access to. Um, I'm thinking about the potential or shared economic vulnerability, not economic anxiety, economic vulnerability of perceptions of marginality that we saw the Black Panthers, you know, effectively exploit to build kind of coalitions, right, with like white patriots in West Virginia. Um, I don't know if any of that's making sense. So I'm just gonna move on to Christine. Uh, Christine, uh, really big fan of this project. I'm really curious, um, what are the antecedents of racial resilience? So given the lack of variation, I'm still curious if like age, again, religiosity, perception is discrimination, linked faith, and system trust, right? Uh, distinguish the more resilient from the moderately resilient amongst Black folk. I'm particularly interested in the relationship of resilience to efficacy measures. I'm glad you've got this in the 2020 CNPS because I would encourage you to look at your measures in relation to the measures I added. Uh, Nathan and I have been looking at racial efficacy from the 2016 study. We have them in the 2020. So how does resilience relate to perceptions of your racial group's influence in politics? And I'm also curious how resilience relates to emotions, particularly pride, and to lesser extent hope. And so I think you can make some use of the emotion questions I added to the 2020 CMPS as well. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there. Really interesting stuff. I'm looking forward to the Q and A and further discussion. Thanks, Davin. Um, I probably should have gone first since Davin hit on a bunch of my comments, but. Uh, I want to reiterate and make a, a few extensions. I'll start with Princess. Princess, you know, I've been a, a huge fan of this project for many years. Um, one reason is, is that Mary and I have spent quite a bit of time, that Mary particularly quite spent quite a bit of time in the Deep South. And um, for anybody who has, you know that Southern identity is real and consequential. Um, one of the things that I really want, and this gets into some of, of Davin's and some of my comments that I've given you earlier, Princess, is on the origins and antecedents of Southern identity across the racial divide. And there's a couple that I'm really interested in. One is rural versus urban. And so this also comes from Mary's experiences of living in Starkville, Mississippi and living in Atlanta. And as she'll tell you, there are quite different experiences, both in the way you think about race, think about the South. And so I am curious um, how that ur rural versus urban divide works. I'm also interested on the results of income, both at the aggregate level and in the individual level. When I used to teach methods, I used to use GDP of the country by strength of national pride. And there's a sharp linear relation, negative linear relationship where the lower your GDP, the more pride you tend to have in your area that you come from. And I think there's good psychological reasons for that level of attachment uh, and for deprivation to be 
a strong inward looking force in terms of identity. So I am interested both in terms of individual level income, but also county level income and to see if you can either doing that with the ANES for um, the pool time series uh, could be interesting. The role of slavery, um, linking up your measures to the um, Archaya Blackwell Sen measures of cotton cultivation as a potential influence. And then religiosity also. I was curious about the link between religiosity and Southern identity. And then also context. How can, and you do really well with the context in the overtime results, but in terms of the links between Southern identity and political attitudes, what type of primes might you expect? And one thing from being in the South is that people from the South seem to um, be especially uh, motivated by people from the outside looking down on them. And I am curious how that uh, prime along that way could potentially change the uh, predictors. Um, but overall, it's, it's fantastic. Same as Christine, who's heard me talk about this a lot, but um, also curious about the origins, um, things that Davin mentioned. I am curious how location uh, influ influences variation and resilience also. And then we've talked a lot about how to activate this potentially. And the context seems, uh, one thing I am curious about the context is that a group-based prime priming, group-based setback versus individual-based setback. And I would expect that the group base would be the more powerful. And then one, this is more kind of throwing it out there. You know, you have this disconnect between voter ID laws that clearly have racist intent, but the way that it's played out is that the racist impact has been somewhat muted in these studies. So I'm curious if racial resilience is the reason for that. If that, yes, we are going to put in racist laws to try to limit voting, but one of the reasons that those may not have been successful is your story of racial resilience. And so I'm curious if, you're, uh, if you view your um, concept as um, having something to say about that. But I'm so thrilled that we both had you here. Thank you. Do you want us to answer the, your uh, response? However you guys want to do it. <laughs> if you had any thoughts on any of those, but if not, we can move on to the Q&A. Um, I can make, make some brief comments. Um, Gavin, um, just thinking about your point about like, um, when does Southern identity um, crystallizes? So um, early on in the project around 2015, 2016, I did a um, host of um, face-to-face interviews. Um, so, um, in terms of the Midwest, um, I interviewed people from Michigan and um, some of the qualitative data um, looking at people who were higher, had higher positive ethic for the South, something that, that they really thought, um, I guess the thing that really made them continue to love the South was like the fact that they had family still in the South. Um, and also some people attended like historically black colleges in the South or um, they continued to go to family reunions or, um, send their children home to their grandma's house like during the summertime. So um, for me, um, this is just from the qualitative data. I think uh, that identity does like crystallize it early on, you know, teenage years. Um, and even when you move, um, like you, you still have like these fun memories regardless if you live in the region or not. Um, and I guess um, thinking about the, the reverse migration of Blacks back to the region and whether um, they're just going to like adhere to these Southern norms or are they going to uh, disrupt norms. Um, so particularly in these urban areas, definitely um, would say, I mean, you, this is just, you know, assumption, but on you, you may get a, a combination of both, but I can see, um, especially like in places like Atlanta, not just Black um, Blacks coming from other regions, but Black uh, immigrants who are coming, who are moving into um, Southern urban cities and how you can have potential um, like conflict because you have these um, differences in like culture and um, 
norms and also just identity and pride, racial, ethnic pride in general. So I can see um, like those norms being disrupted in urban spaces. Um, I guess the last thing I'll talk about is the religion and Christine can go. Um, I, did, um, I do look at um, like this correlation between Southern identity and uh, biblical illiteralism or just um, church attendance that I find like the weak, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, weak correlation between these um, these items. Um, and I, I, religion definitely will play a role in, this, in, in the development of Southern identity or even the preservation of the identity. Um, so I'm really just trying to find a way to really understand um, like, the exact role of religion. I think about one of the um, interview interviewees that I did in Mississippi. It was an older black guy who who wasn't who he didn't attend church, but he talked about how church still impacts him in different ways because it's just the way it is and how things are. And so it's like he had no choice but to follow the way, you know, um, even though he didn't feel himself um, be, being religious. So um, I can see how religion shaping the the environment you know, and over time being filtered in the identity um, in a very indirect way, but that's something I uh, definitely will be exploring uh, going forward. And thank you uh, all for both your, your comments. Um, so thank you, uh, Michael and Davin, for the questions which seemingly get harder when you're trying to expand mm -hmm. dissertation into books. So I'll try to do this um, the best way possible. So. Devin, thinking about the racial efficacy piece, I really do think um, that's probably something that definitely should be included. And with the 2020 CMB PS, I'll be able to look at the extent to which racial efficacy is influenced with, um, well, is correlated with racial resilience. Just on suspicion, I believe there's probably something there there um, because thinking about the internal efficacy items, it is likely the reason that the racial resilience doesn't pop on its own because it's so interconnected with the feeling around um, the ability to make change. But I will say that just thinking kind of a larger thought point around how measurement occurs for Black Americans, even I think what Dawson gives us around like this individual is the collective and like for African Americans, the collective sense of consciousness is the, the individual sense of consciousness really always pushes me to think like, what are we actually grabbing when we look at these internal efficacy items? So I'm, I'm kind of wondering, I guess I'll go back and look at you and Nathan's paper again around how does racial, racial efficacy connect to an internal efficacy and kind of can we use those interchangeably? Um, but that's, that's just a thought experiment. So definitely looking forward to grabbing into that and also thinking about the role of emotions. I don't think um, kind of from a broad spec, anything around hope and pride is ex like, is out of the territory for racial resilience. In fact, one of the, the items, the racial resilience items tries to get into how this sense of pride is connected to perseverance. Um, so that's, I think it's just muddy waters that I haven't looked at emotion specifically, but again, that's something I'll be able to look into with a larger um, survey and more expansive budget. Um, so I thank you. Michael, for your question, you ended on a tall order question, and I, I don't like those. I know. <laughs> so I'm going to say it two ways. So I guess first is kind of like a normative sense, and then two is like the empirical standpoint. So thinking your question, is racial resilience kind of the answer to um, attempts at like Black suffering? So like we see racial, re we see voter ID laws, and then we see racial resilience. One, I'm going to say how are we going to be able to disentangle like the ordering? Like, is it racial resilience that leads to um, voter ID laws or is it kind of the, the other way around? But then also thinking, you know, do we really want to get in the territory of pathologizing if Black folks just sense of resilience is something that's their answer to all types of suffering? I don't want to get in that territory. So I guess from a normative standpoint, no. But from an empirical standpoint, when we looked at the two voting outcomes, First, um, there was two questions. So one waiting in line to vote and the other was facing a personal issue while voting. And this last iteration of the survey, I did find that racial resilience was more connected to waiting in line to vote than experiencing a personal issue. So if we had to think about how voter ID laws may, any suspicion around how that might interact um, with wanting to wait versus seeing an issue, I would say that, yeah, we probably can say that racial resilience is a part of this counter mobilization ethos that's leading African-Americans to withstand additional hardships in order to vote. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there because I'm eager to hear um, what other others have to say. So thank you. 
Thank you. I think we can now open the floor for questions. It might be easiest to use the raise hand notification. Uh, and I saw Isabel has her hand raised, so I'll give the floor to you, Isabel, and then uh, Simone and our Jeff next. Hello. Thank you again for these really intellectually rich and so important projects. Um, I'm really excited to read them in their full book form. Um, this question is particularly for Princess, and a, a big thank you again for this work because it does hit really close to home coming from not necessarily the region that you outline as the South, but a region that everyone basically considers the unofficial South or the contested South. Um, and I think that with regards to that, it does remind me of a lot of Tesla's question and a lot of Davin's question, um, that question of sort of urban versus rural and that question of religiosity, but in a different sense. So your work really reminds me a lot of um, Jack Halberstam and Scott Herring's notion of metro normativity of not, no, not only that difference between the urban and rural, but particularly the values that are held with those sorts of uh, regions. And this is kind of a, just a big way of saying, given that the South has the highest percentage of LGBT people and particularly LGBT people of color leading the Northeast by 11 percentage points of all of the US regions, how might these perceived elements of the South or Southern identity, both in the imaginaries of Northern regions, Northern peoples, even and particularly, especially Metro Northern peoples relate not only to the um, sort of ways that you uh, conceptualize what that Southern identity is early on in your presentation compared to those on the ground realities, but also in the development of the strength of the Southern identity for not only what we consider or what most literature considers as these are who are Southern, but also black Southerners and when you get you know, I imagine this is going to be a much larger project into other subgroups. Um, yeah, so how does that sort of relate back to this production of Southern identity, not only in the imaginaries of these non-Southern peoples and these non-Southern regions, but also to the people who are on the ground, to the people who are, again, the one of the most diverse, if we wanna use that sort of language, um, populations within the United States, but often imagined as, you know, again, that big word cloud, cowboys and hicks and whatever. So again, that was rambling, but thank you. Thank you so much. No, thank you for that question. Um, um, so when I, when I did the um, two surveys that included the open-ended uh, responses, that the purpose of those um, open-ended responses was to really understand how um, Americans who live across these subgroups, Americans who live in the South, um, opposed to Americans who live in who live in other regions, how they perceive the South. And um, I didn't show it here in this uh, presentation, but across racial and religious groups, across um, all these subgroups, you you get the same um, adjectives describing the South. Like you you get the same things, you know, racist, uh, homophobic, or religious, blah blah blah. But with the thing that I saw that was the difference was how um, White, I mean, uh, how people living in the South frame the adjectives. For example, if you talked about, uh, so if someone from the North um, said that Southerners were religious or uh, bigots, in the South, people also said religion. They were religious, but they they talked about they called themselves God loving or um, people who um, have principles and values who um, are not. Um, in, so basically they, they found a way to justify why, why they're religious or um, I guess a bigot or whatever. So they found a way to really make soften the blow of like the same traits that um, that Northerners you know, use to, to talk about the South. Um, and I do um, think that to this point of like the urban rural divide and how people um, perceive like um, um, Southerners who live in, you know, in cities versus um, these rural areas. Um, I, I, um, I, I think, you know, over the last 15, 20 years, I think there, there may be differences, you know, given like um, um, the, the influence of uh, Atlanta or these other Charlotte, you know, these places are hubs of migration and people are moving back to these locations for, you know, different, di different reasons, but, um, I don't think right now, well, in the data, um, and I can't find, I can't really look at it now because I don't have enough respondents, but I don't think there's a, a, 
over like um, on average, I don't think there's a difference in, in terms of how people are um, perceiving Southern Southerners living in rural areas versus Southerners um, living in um, urban areas. But that's something I definitely want to look um, into going forward. Um, and so thank you for the question. I, um, and um, I hope that answered the question. And if there's something else I missed, please let me know. So am I up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I've thank first, thanks so much to both of you for your presentations. Uh, in the middle of the summer reactivating, the end of the summer, <laughs> reactivating my brain was really incredible. Um, so I have a question, really quick one for both of you. So first for, for Christine, um, the concept of resilience. Um, I can logically think of reasons why resilience might actually breed passivity. Um, rather than activism. You say, look, we can take it, right? Um, and we don't need to react. And so there seems to be, just at a logical theoretical level, I'd like to hear more about the kind of the mechanism by which resilience gets you to, at least logically, if not empirically, to the kind of behaviors and orientations that you might expect. Um, and you know, it, it, you know, in Jewish studies, which is my field, that it, that resilience is often seen to be correlated with passivity, which is why I'm 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 asking that. And and for for Princess, um, getting to I think David and Michael both wanted to know about the origins, um, the origin story of Southern identity. And you had had you had had on the one hand you had slavery and you had the civil rights movement, and in between. When I think of Southern po political identity, both especially for African Americans, again, logically, I think of the Great Migration. And the literature on lynching really talks about that as being absolutely crucial for bringing you know, the, the era of lynching to an end. Um, and so I would think that, that it would be finding out the attitudes of the progeny of those who were, um, who stayed during the Great Migration versus those who moved later, that would be that would be pretty important. And I don't know if your um, your data allows you to tap into that, um, but that would seem to me to be an important origin story for that. And my question to you is: is Do you have evidence that that speaks to that the long term political legacies of this kind of giant demographic changes? Um, in the um, African American community in the South. Um, I'll start by saying thank you uh, for the question. And I think you raise a good point with the literature that I haven't interacted much with um, in terms of Jewish studies, but kind of been branching out outside of African American politics to understand how other cultures respond and other cultures and religions respond to hardship. So I think that's something um, I'm kind of reading in the direction to, to look to look into, because one thing is that I don't find, I guess, from a logical, uh, well, from an empirical point first, because that's that's where I like to start, is that I don't find a lot of agreement with um, African Americans' resilience being distinctive, and that's something that I mean a lot in the sense of it's closer to 0.5. So they're like, while the hardship items are around 0 0.8, 0 0.9, the mean. The mean for some of the um, distinctiveness items are around 0.6. So this kind of leads me to think maybe African-Americans aren't thinking about their own resilience as something that's distinct, as something that can be um, across different cultures. So seeing how, one, the composition of resilience is associated with the behavioral response to adversity, I kind of can't really say what should lead to activism versus what should lead to passivity. But also I think what's interesting is that um, like I mentioned, when I fielded the studies during the racial uprisings of 2020, I had a little bit more, you know, ex more concrete or larger magnitude results, which kind of waned off when I reran the study. So trying to understand how resilience changed over time. And I think that may lend to the um, passivity piece, but I think that's something that's up for exploration. So I'll start to look um, in that direction, and I'll reach out to you if you have any specific uh, direction in terms of getting getting toward this. Also, um, thanks, Jeff, for your question um, about the origins of Southern identity. Um, so I have thought a lot about this. 
Um, the survey data definitely uh, can answer the question, but um, going forward, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to work um, to really understand stand this. But um, the sociology and history literature really sort of give me some insight into like what would be the origins for uh, African Americans. So um, this book, um, Zandra Robinson, she looks at like this original identity um, among African Americans. And one thing she talked about was um, during the civil rights movement, like this increase in pride in the region as a result of like these relative gains that um, Black Americans were able to achieve, you know, um, as a result, um, you know, of decades of protests and litigation. And so um, what she argues that, you know, these changes, these, you know, the increase in political power and um, economic opportunity post civil rights movement increased pride in the region in their ability um, and autonomy to make, you know, um, to build a place and build a home uh, within America, a country that's been um, super, you know, oppressive to the uh, racial group. So she, she talks about, you know, pride after the civil rights movement. Um, and in terms of like this origin of um, Southern identity for Blacks um, who are moving back to the region, um, there's a book by this historian and he talks about some of the pull factors are, you know, the, the um, higher levels of Black institutions in the South. So you have, you know, more access to Black churches, you know, historical Black colleges um, and um, also higher concentrations of Blacks in general, which in, in leads to more political power, especially in local elections, um, which is another reason why people are, you know, Blacks are more attracted to the region. And lastly, they talked about like just the um, affordability of um, the living, cost of living in the South, and also the cost of um, the ease of being able to um, send your, your, your um, children to college, for example, given that they're um, surrounded by more um, historically Black colleges. So, um, I don't, in my data, I can't answer it, but I really think it's, it's something about, you know, how people are perceiving the region after, you know, these relative gains from, you know, federal legislation and also just looking at like the, the region as a whole. I mean, one thing I should say is in, in my interviews and in uh, the interviews of other scholars, one thing that is clear um, that black, Blacks in the South and Blacks who move back to the South, they don't perceive the South as being more racist than places other regions. And so like, you know, and if you take that, if you believe that country as a whole, like you're going to experience racial discrimination, regardless of where you are in the country. Now you're thinking about, okay, where can, like cost of living, you're thinking about like, um, is there, are there institutions that are welcoming, you know, more racially inclusive? Um, are, am I going to be able to live in a neighborhood um, with people who um, are not going to discriminate against me? So all in all, given you just higher concentration of Blacks in that region, um, other scholars, you know, they argue that, you know, that civil rights movement was a, you know, a critical time uh, in developing, you know, this pride and love for the region and one's um, ability to change the region for the better for the racial group. Thank you. Okay, I see uh, hands, oh, hands, hands, hands. So I think, uh... Zeta came up first. Hi, thank you so much for your presentations. I really appreciate your work. Um, I have a question for both of you all. Uh, the first question is for Princess. Um, you mentioned as one of your research problems or observations is that there is an assumption in the literature about Black monolithic identity in surveys. And so I'm curious to know, and how do you address this assumption in the survey that you implement? Um, do you distinguish between individuals who are African American and individuals who um, are African descent of immigrant background? Um, and then I'm also curious to know, in your Southern identity measure, is there, do you expect that there is variation in um, age group and how Southern identity might manifest. So I'm thinking for one of your example, you mentioned about the abortion, how all in all um, the respondents are against abortion, but I'm curious to know if that response and other responses might vary uh, based, based on age group. Um, and then the, question, the next questions uh, for Chris, Christian, um, your sample is, um, you mentioned about your sample, um, can you talk a little bit about your sampling strategy um, 
what cities, regions were sample age groups and how might this inform your results? Thank you for that question. Um, so um, going back to um, the slide where I talked about black monolithic assumption. So um, I, was I was referring to um, some of the Southern politics literature that um, the case the case they made that for the reasons why they didn't include like black respondents in their surveys or their theories of Southern identity was because, you know, one Southern identity is not important, may not be important for black Americans because they, they have this uniformity in like these political outcomes. So they're more likely to support democratic um, uh, presidential candidates and they're more likely to identify with the democratic party. Um, and so that was like, you know, the, the, pr the primary case for why Blacks were not, you know, included in these studies. And so, um, but to your other part about, you know, this assumption about just like that variation in Black identity, you know, um, Black Americans um, versus Black Americans born in the country versus immigrants. Um, I don't um, look at, um, I don't look at, it, look at that in my analyses, but that is definitely something I would um, uh, love to look um, in future studies. Um, I would, just think about Southern identity. I don't. I don't think I would expect that. I don't. It'll be. It's very difficult to really like understand. But maybe like, depending on how long you've been in the country, I can see how that's shaping like whether you would have a Southern identity if you're an immigrant. Um, but um, I think another question you had was about age differences and like whether that um, that impact like uh, support for like these social policies. For one, I did look at um, at the difference age differences in uh, terms of those blacks who score high on Southern identity and blacks who score low. But I found found was actually those who score higher on Southern identity they were three years younger than those who score low. So it really speaks to this like post civil rights era of like you know this this um, identity being more new and older generations may have not caught on to you know like the love for country, but. Yeah, I find that they're actually young, Southern identifiers, high Southern identifiers are actually on average three years younger um, than um, low identifiers. And so um, I did look, I, may, I can't remember, but I didn't find, I don't think I actually looked at it. So I'll look at it and I can get back to you on that. Um, I don't wanna tell you the wrong answer, but I didn't, I did find just overall Southern Blacks um, were more, um, more or less supportive of abortion and other social policies. But thank you, great question. Uh, hi, Beta, I should have mentioned in the presentation, it was a sample um, that I co uh, contracted with Lucid. So it was a split of African-Americans registered and non-registered and what a general African-American sample would look like. So mostly Democrats had a decent spread on age, um, a 50-50, well, a 51-49 split on gender and um, I guess in relations to princesses work about 52% come from the South, but I think in any study, if you're reaching out to African-Americans, they're gonna come from the South in like the 10 large metros. Um, so just a pretty standard um, sample. I also, in where I um, could, I waited on age, gender and education just to try to get to some sample um, targets. Thank you. Yep, I see Will, and hopefully we have time for final questions from Will and Danielle. Uh, I think Danielle is first. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I have two thoughts, formal question um, for Princess, um, for like Michael mentioned how like in like places that have low income will have, tend to have more, have more national pride, like kind of psychologically compensating. I guess I combined that with the point you mentioned about how Southern identity for whites and blacks developed at different points in time. So I guess one to like, do you th are, did you find, or do you have expectations on like there'd be situations that would raise Southern identity among one group, but it was that same event would lower it among the others. Like, um, like when there was like, when it's like, when like South Carolina wouldn't lower the Confederate flag at first, that like raised it among white Southerners, but lowered it among black Southerners. And then when they did take it down, did, like the reverse happened or 
that makes sense. Kind of. Sorry, that was rambling. No, definitely. Um, so one situation, I mean, it was recent, also in my home state, state Mississippi. Um, so last year, uh, Mississippi voted to change the, the flag with the Confederate emblem. And um, also me being in Mississippi quarantined in the pandemic, I saw this firsthand, but I would still expect this to like play out if, you know, I were to do an um, experiment or, or something. Um, so um, what happened was, you know, for over 40 years, Black activists in the state have been working to get, you know, the change to Confederate flag. In 2001, they brought it to a vote and of course it failed. But in 2020, they finally passed, you know, uh, the, um, the bill to, uh, well, actually the, the, they didn't vote. It didn't, it wasn't a referendum. It was actually the state legislator um, um, that actually voted to change the flag. And I mean, you saw totally different views about Mississippi and the pride, you know, Black Americans, of course, I mean, Blacks in, the, in Mississippi were celebrating and Blacks, I mean, in some whites, they were very upset. And uh, the whole, their point of contention for a lot of them, they argued that it wasn't about the flag, it was more so about the, the state being able to use its power to, you know, do something that the citizens actually supported. And so I can see how these, a situation like that could change how people um, perceive this, the South um, across racial groups. And if you remember in, in my, self, my South Feeling Thermometer, you see that um, Southern whites, um, they were the only group um, over time for their level of warmth towards the region to decline. So Southern, non-Southern whites, non-Southern Blacks, and Southern uh, Blacks, their, their um, level of warmth towards the South increased over time. But Southern whites, their level of warmth um, towards the South actually decreased. So it could be like these changes in what perceived to be a culture or whatever, um, a way of living in the, in the region. And over time, like they're, they're perceiving the place to be different. Um, but thank you for that question. Danielle, you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay, I will be brief. Um, thank you so much for these very interesting presentations. I have a quick question for both of you. So first, um, for Princeton, so, pr Princeton, gosh, for Princess. Um, so you st you started by talking about complicating the the South dummy variable, and I thought that was a very compelling opening way to to talk about your project. Um, and then you said that you know, the amount of time that is spent in the South might also influence um, Southern identity. And I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit more um, or whether like what Davin and Michael were saying, there's a certain point in someone's life where then identity kind of um, tapers off or, you know, there are these moments in, 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 in people's lives that are more influential. Um, then for Christine, one of the, I'm also interested in the contextual part of this as well. And we might not expect racial resilience to matter everywhere in the same way. So we might expect it to matter more when we have local leaders um, or political leaders talking about and activating racial resilience. So I was thinking about Steve Pettigrew's work on, on voting lines and whether you've interacted um, voting lines with racial resilience to see whether this matters in different ways based on the particular political context. But thanks again to you both. Thank you. So um, just speaking about like time um, and or like where there's like a critical moment that like really um, crystallized like Southern identity. So what I would argue that um, just thinking about Americans who are born and raised in the South, I would think um, that like by, you know, these teenage years, this identity could, um, and it also depends on states. I, I have some work on like political culture, which we'll I'll talk about. Well, it, anyway, so in time, so depending on where you live in the South, by, by teenage years, this identity may be crystallized. But those Americans who are moving back to the South, I would think that like your, like depending on how long you live in the region, that's, that will impact like your level of like identification with the place. So if you recently moved to the, the South, I can see how, like that identity is not present, but if you've lived there 20 years, you know, over time, I can see, you know, like um, the identity developing and becoming stronger. So um, I, I do, I see, I see, um, I see both the time in the region and also they, there may be a critical event that um, shapes the identity, but it depends on 
your like how it yeah it depends on the on like your your relationship with the region if you if you were born and raised there versus if you just moved there recently or um you're a migrant or an immigrant Thank you, uh, Danielle, for the question. I think you're spot on in saying that interacting racial resilience with some uh, willingness to engage in an act such as waiting in line to vote. So I'm curious, do you mean the actual people who waited in line? So like kind of on the behavioral side and not the willingness side? Yes? Okay, yeah, no, that's something that, um, I haven't uh, done, but I have read uh, Stephen's work and then also a professor at um, Riverside, Daniel Biggers has done some stuff on like waiting in line um, and kind of how that reduces efficacy for future elections. So I do think it's an open possibility to look into um, kind of what are the detrimental effects of waiting in line and if racial resilience actually operates after the behavior versus prior to um, the behavior. So that's, that's something that I'm hoping to dig into. Okay, we're a couple of minutes over, so I think we should wrap. I don't want to thank. Okay. Uh, so sorry, would you have more? Oh, no, I was, I mean, I can stay here all day. This is actually like, I just really <laughs> miss, you know, we have the summer and like, it's not a seminar anymore. And it's like, man, this feels really good. Thank you well, all for your attention. What we often do is is keep the keep the Zoom open. Um, the formal part of the talk can conclude, and those who want to catch up for a few minutes extra are, are of course welcome to stay. Michael, did you have um, an announcement about um, future events co-sponsored with CSD and the Department of Political Science? Yeah. So on top of thanking Christine and Princess for their excellent talks, I did want to note that this is the prequel to our. American Politics CSD Speaker Series that Danielle is mostly taking the lead on, but I am co-sponsor. And our first talk will be four weeks from today, virtually with um, Liliana Mason and Nathan Calmo on their new book, Radical American Partisanship. So that should be awesome. And we you'll hear much more from us on that front. And just a huge congratulations again to our two panelists uh, for the whirlwind of accomplishment that's happened to you this summer. Good luck on your moves, uh, on the starts of your careers. Uh, obviously, great things uh, are ahead of both of you from what we've seen today. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone.